now. Now I've started recording. Hello everyone, this is CircuitPython Weekly for May 31st, Tuesday, May 31st, 2022. This is the time of the week when we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. This week we're delayed a day because of the Memorial Day holiday in the U.S. I'm Dan and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. And CircuitPython is a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit. So if you want to support them and CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. We host this meeting on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. Usually this meeting happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time, 11 a.m. Pacific Time, except when it coincides with the U.S. holiday, which was yesterday. In the notes doc, there's a link to a calendar you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app. We also send notifications about upcoming meetings via Discord. If you would like to receive these notifications, ask us to add you to the CircuitPythonistas Discord role. There is a notes doc to accompany the meeting and recording. The notes doc contains timestamps time to go along with the video so you can use the doc to view only the parts of the video that interest you most. The meeting tends to run 45 to 90 minutes. Um, you can skip around because of that. Um, let's see, what else would I like to say? If you want to see, the, the meeting notice is always pinned in uh, the pinned messages in the CircuitPython channel. So for instance, here I'll show you by uh, pinning in, or looking at the pinned messages. Just go there and you can find a link to the notes doc and the information about the next up upcoming meeting. We hold a meeting in five parts. Community news, the state of CircuitPython, libraries and Blinka, hug reports, status updates, and finally in the weeds. And uh, I won't explain those in detail right now, but I will in the beginning of each uh, one. So let's go ahead and I will try. I built a, Katni told me she built a timestamp generating engine, uh, which was written in sort of Python, and I did the same thing with the CPX. So we'll try that. Oh, it might help if I plug it in. In which case, it's time is off, so never mind. <laughs> Next time I'll do that. All right. Uh, let's start with community news. Um, this is news from the weekly, our weekly Python for Microcontrollers newsletter, which usually goes out via email on Tuesday mornings this week. It'll be Wednesday morning. Visit adafruit.daily to subscribe to the newsletter. Thanks to Anne for putting the newsletter together. If you have any Python or on hardware projects to share or find content you'd like to see included, please continue consider contributing to the newsletter. You can open a PR on GitHub, uh, uh, tag at sign and underscore engineer on Twitter with the hashtag CircuitPython or email cpnews at adafruit.com with the news and a link to whatever the news is about. Um, so let me go ahead and go over the community news that we have for in the upcoming newsletter. Um, I'll put a timestamp in here. Uh, uh, the CircuitPython GitHub repo has reached 3,000 stars. Those are stars you can star your favorite repos in GitHub. Um, it exceeded 3,000 stargazers this week. Thank you all the people who have chosen to star the CircuitPython code repository. Thank you very much. It helps our visibility. Um, next, uh, Anne Barella talk CircuitPython with Crowd Supplies Helen Lee. The Crowd Supply Teardown Sessions, a series of interviews and hands-on learning sessions with Crowd Supply creators, staff, and lots of special guests, hosts Ann Barella, your editor of the newsletter, to discuss CircuitPython and, and more. Um, and did this happen already or it's going to happen? It happened Friday. Okay, great. So go to the links and you can you can see the interview. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, next, uh, MicroPython is up to 112 sponsors. Um, 
MicroPython sponsor, sponsor, sponsorship fundraising continues with 112 people and organizations providing monthly support for MicroPython development. Their new target is $10,000 a month, which would allow them to hire more, for, more folks to work on the software. Please consider sponsoring, especially if you use MicroPython and or CircuitPython, which derives from MicroPython. We are immensely grateful to MicroPython, and we continue to uh, pull down code from it uh, whenever they have a release. Uh, without MicroPython, CircuitPython would not exist. Adafruit's been sponsoring um, MicroPython, and uh, we encourage everyone else to do that as well. Thank you. Uh, finally, uh, this week, Naomi Cedar, who gave the keynote, a keynote at the recent PyCon US, uh, her keynote is available. You can see it on YouTube, and the text of the talk is online. There are links in the in the notes. Okay. And as I mentioned, uh, the uh, newsletter is published every Tuesday, except this week it's on Wednesday because of the holiday. Please contribute um, to the newsletter whenever you find interesting news related to Python and microcontrollers. Thank you. Next up is a st the state of circuit Python libraries in Blinka. This is kind of a statistical overview of what's going on in circuit Python in the past week. Um, we'll start with describing pull requests overall. In the last week, there were 24 pull requests merged by 17 authors. Uh, a new author I see is MLH, ML Hakim, as I think is the name. Thank you very much. If you're not new, thank you anyway. Um, there were 17 authors, six reviewers. There were 16 closed issues by 10 people and eight opened by seven people. So we closed eight issues successfully and we were reducing the number of issues, which is always great. Um, Scott, would you like to discuss the core? Sure, I'm happy to do that. Sorry for the laundry noise. Um, numbers for the core. Uh, we had 15 pull requests merged from 12 different authors, so thank you to all of those authors. Um, I think most of these folks have been around, so thank you to all of the authors. We had three re reviewers, uh, Dan, Jeff, and myself, uh, so always looking for more reviewers. Uh, we have 17 open pull requests. Uh, three of those are over 100 days old. Only one is 200 or more days old, so should take a look at that. Um, and then a lot are kind of in the middle ground between 0 and 86 days. So again, we should take a look at those. Um, we have 16 closed issues by four people, or six closed issues by four people and four open by four people. So we're net down, which is good. We're hovering right around this 510 open issues mark, which is good. We have five active milestones. Um, 44 are open for 8.0. We're going to want to triage those for 8.0. Um, but we did uh, tag main as 8.0, so we've been able to get some changes, some breaking changes into the main code base. So if you are if are using absolute latest, uh, beware that that is going to be changing and we're going to be breaking some stuff. Um, but yeah, that's where we are in the core. Thank you very much, Scott. Okay. No problem. Libraries. Uh, Katni, would you like to talk about libraries? Sure thing. So this applies to all of the Adafruit CircuitPython libraries, which is everything that starts with Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, as well as a couple extras like our cookie cutter and the community bundle. So we had across all of these repos, eight pull requests merged with five authors and five reviewers. Um, of those merged pull requests, most were zero or one days old and one was four days old. Um, leaving 27 open pull requests across all of these repositories. We had seven closed issues by six people and four opened by three people, leaving us with 641 open issues. 187 of those are good first issues. If you're interested in contributing to Python or to CircuitPython on the Python side of things, consider going to circuitpython.org slash contributing. You'll find all of this information and more. If you're interested in reviewing, check out the open PRs. Uh, if you don't have the hardware, you can look at it for syntax, spelling, so on and so forth. Um, if you do have the hardware, please test it. Leave a comment, let us know you did, and once you are comfortable with that, we can look into 
um, leveling you up to our review team. Um, if you're interested in providing code or documentation, check out um, the open, uh, open issues. Um, as I said, the 187 of our issues are good first issues. Um, so if you're new to everything, check that out. If you are looking for something a little more complicated or um, that sort of thing, uh, you can look for bugs or enhance or bug or enhancement labels. Um, and if you need, if you're new to everything, we have a guide on contributing to CircuitPython using Git and GitHub, and we are always available on Discord to help you out. So please don't let that intimidate you away from considering uh, joining our contributing members. Um, there were no new libraries in the last seven days, but there were three updated libraries, uh, which I will not read through, but they're available in the notes. That's what I've got. Thank you, Katni. Okay, next up is Blinka. And Melissa, can you read? Melissa, are you there? If you're not, I'll go ahead. Okay. So maybe having trouble, so let's, or out of the room, so I'll go ahead. So uh, Blinka is a compatibility layer. Hey, I'm sorry, oh, I'm that's back. All right. That's all right. I had to walk away for a second. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, Blinka is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for uh, MicroPython, Raspberry Pi, and other single board computers. And uh, this week we had one pull request merged by one author and one reviewer. There are currently four open pull requests among the repositories. There were three closed issues by three people and zero open by zero people, leaving a net of 78 open issues. And there were 8,974 PyWheels downloads in the last month, and we are currently supporting 88 boards. And that's it. Okay, thank you very much, Melissa. Okay, we'll move on to, to Hug Reports now. I'll take another timestamp. Um, Hug Reports is where we highlight folks in the CircuitPython community and beyond for doing awesome things. Uh, we do this in a round robin fashion. I'll start and then we go in alphabetical order after that. If somebody isn't here, I'll just read their contribution. Uh, I'll start. Um, I'll take a timestamp for myself. Uh, so first, um, thanks very much to Jeff for fixing things even while he's on vacation. I guess it's probably re vacation is relaxing, but working on CircuitPython may also be relaxing in some way, so that's great. Uh, I, but Jeff, always feel free to take vacation <laughs> instead. Um, and he's fixing things that sort of may come to mind and they've been, they, they're, they're things that have been annoying us for a while and that's very nice. Uh, thanks to Scott for experimenting with space savings last week. Uh, he discovered some things which he'll talk to you about, about the translations, which uh, can, we might be able to save a lot of space on certain builds. Thanks to Tektrick for tracking down incompatibilities with the new version of Sphinx, the documentation system 500. It's not quite as painful as it could have been, but there were plenty of changes that we need to make. And thanks to Diso Rabian, who's testing uh, matrix portal network issues and has been really helpful in figuring out what works and what fails after a certain period of time. Okay, I'll move on to C. Grover now. And I'll read since they're not here. Thanks to Foamy Guy for taking the Titano backlight issue and running it towards the finish line with changes to the CircuitPython core. Also appreciate Foamy's comments on the touchscreen calibrator example pull request. And that brings us to Foamy Guy. Take another timestamp. Um, thanks to C. Grover for submitting touchscreen calibration example pull requests. Thanks to Jerry and for everything they contributed, especially around radio modules. Testing some of the older PRs in those libraries was my introduction to RF, and Jerry was very helpful. And a group hug. Uh, next up is uh, Jeff, uh, who also gives a group hug. 
And next up is Katni. I have a few hugs today. Uh, first up for Tech Trek for finding an issue with the libraries over the weekend and immediately fixing it. Um, Thanks, uh, updated and something we had in our conf.py for the documentation was no longer, um, was no longer happy. So Sphinx was failing and TechTrix took care of that. Um, to Jerry for helping me out with a project that I got the pieces for ages ago and of course left to the last minute to finish. Uh, he's super excited to help me out with this. So. Um, that's really good because with help I can probably get it done in time. And to Liz for doing all the code and firmware testing for the Cutie Pie uh, ESP32 Pico guide that I'm doing. Um, it turns out uh, she had the hardware for the guide I was working on and I have the hardware for the guide she's working on, but we stuck with it and we're gonna just, you know, power through testing each other's code. <laughs> um, and that's what I've got. Okay, thank you, Katni. Okay, next up is Maker Melissa. I just wanted to, I wanted to give a hug report to Katni for helping with updating Fritzing, uh, to Paul Cutler for contributing to the OpenSign project, to Anne Burrell for your great interview on Tom's Hardware, and uh, group hug to everyone else. All right, thank you, Melissa. Okay, uh, next up is Mark Ambler, who's not uh, able to speak, who gives a group hug. And then... Uh, also, next up after that is Tammy Makes Things, who also gives a group hug. And next up is Scott. Hello. Um, I also just I just wanted to say thank you to everybody who's here and who participates uh, in good faith on our Discord. It's so nice to work with you all, and <laughs> the context is that I woke up to it. Uh, kind of mean message from somebody on a different Discord this morning, so I, it was just made me appreciate the space that we've built and that we all invest our time and, and uh, patience into. So thank you, everybody, for that. All right. Thank you, Scott. Okay, next up is um, Tectric, who is uh, in the chat but can't speak, so I'll go ahead and read theirs. Thanks to Katni for the quick help getting an Adabot patch going to support the Sphinx 5.0 re upgrade we just talked about. Thanks to Dan H for helping to get the manual fixes for other issues regarding the Sphinx update reviewed and merged. And a group hug. All right, thank you, Tectric. Okay, next up is status updates, which is also a round of Robin where we just say what we're up to, which could be CircuitPython or other things if you have other things uh, occupying your time that you'd like to talk about. That's fine. Um, so I'll start. Um, last week, right after the meeting, I released uh, CircuitPython 7.3.0 final, um, which has not, up to now, it does not seem to have had a lot of regressions or problems, which is great. It has it was really shaken out in advance. Um, I did fix a problem with multiple rotary encoders on Espressif. That fix will be in 731, assuming we have a 731 release, which we probably will. But I'm holding off on that until we add a few more other bug fixes. Uh, over the weekend, I fixed some buffer and buffer size issues with the ESP32 SPI library. Uh, someone had found a problem where it wouldn't talk properly to certain kinds of web servers. A review of that is in progress. And also, I decided to clean up that library in general. It has a lot of deprecated methods in its classes and stuff and could really use a cleanup to make it more compatible, in particular, the socket part, to make the socket part more compatible with the way sockets work in regular Python. And I'm now debugging other network problems, specifically problems on the matrix portal, but I think they apply in general to uh, ESP32 SPI and maybe even to Adafruit requests in general. All right. Um, next up is C. Grover. I'll take a timestamp. Uh, wrapped up touchscreen calibration example pull request for built-in displays supported by Adafruit touchscreen. The Cedar Grove NAU7802 CircuitPython library was placed into the community bundle for use with the new NAU7802 breakout and a couple of custom feathering boards. It was an interesting and complicated learning experience or adventure. 
developing a prototype gamma-sensitive brightness control helper for the matrix portal that currently works with display AO, object color, and fill attributes, as, as well as bitmap palettes. A bonus is that the algorithm, algorithm works nicely with NeoPixels and other RGB LEDs. Now I'm on a steep learning curve trying to figure out how to walk a multi-layer display I.O. group tree to one, capture initial full brightness color information, and two, modify display I.O. object colors based on the prototype's gamma-sensitive color brightness algorithm. The goal is to create a helper or class that can literally adjust linearly adjust display brightness similar to a TFT backlight. Lower brightness means less heat, lower power consumption, and a display that's easier to photograph. Okay, thank you, Steve, Steve, uh, C. Grover. Next up is Katni. So last week, I started the QtPy ESP32 Pico Guide. I worked with Liz for testing code and firmware on the Pico Guide. Uh, and I updated the Feather ESP32 v2 guide with new drivers. Um, this week, uh, planning to finish the ESP32 Pico guide. However, it is on hold until I have hardware. Um, I really appreciate Liz testing things. Uh, however, it was running into I need GIFs and I have to actually like iterate on code and um, to make anything work. And I wasn't sure whether she had time to do that and so on. And uh, Lamar put the board in the shop this morning, so it is on the way. So that guide should be up soon enough. Um, the next thing I'm up to is uh, Whippersnapper um, need, needs CircuitPython board reset, uh, bootloader reset GIFs for seven different boards. Basically, they just need showing the right rhythm to get into the bootloader and um i agreed to help out with that so i will be doing that um then after that is the github fancy profile guide basically using tools to make your github profile more fun and attractive um light tower and next is a is a light tower github action status light it's something you plug into your computer by usb and it runs desktop python um I still have on my list, but low lower uh, priority uh, is the Add a Project to PyLeap guide, which was started but never completed, and then um, to set up the repository for the I squared C addresses guide migration to Markdown. And that's what I've got going on. Okay, thank you, Katni. Okay, next up is Baker Melissa. Uh, last week, I finished updating the Feathers and Featherwings guide. Um, I, I deprecated an old general e-ink guide in favor of four separate guides I wrote. Uh, I added a bunch of new checks to circuitpython.org repo and fixed any issues found with those checks. I worked on some miscellaneous GitHub issues, and I went through guide feedback for the NeoPixels on Raspberry Pi guide. This week, I'm going to work on some more GitHub issues. I'll possibly be circling back to working on touchscreens on the Raspberry Pi, and I'm not sure what else at this point. Okay, thank you, Melissa. Okay, next up, I'll read uh, Mark Gambler's. Uh, did a small PR to, to add setting static IPs for Wi-Fi that was asked for in an enhancement issue. Thank you, that should be very useful to a number of people. Uh, next up, I'll read Tammy Makes Things. Didn't work on CircuitPython stuff last week. Sad face. This week, aiming to get back into my regular group. All right. Uh, next up is Scott. Hello. Um, last week, walk, wrapped up the .env stuff, which should be cool. Um, that allows you to do... Um, os.getenv from a .env file on the root file system. Um, and then I kind of got sidetracked into the world of trying to find uh, ways to optimize our code space. Um, along that sidetrack, well, I made a repo called F elf section graph, which uh, keeps track of the dependencies between individual elf sections, which are like per function, per data. Thing, and then if they're not used, we can the the linker will just discard them. Um, so I did some research there. Did not find quite as much as I had hoped. 
Um, and then I got a little distracted. I made treemap.dev, which is just like a upload a JSON file and it will allow you to view it as a tree map, which is a very common visualization for like how much file space is my file system taking and things like that. So that that's kind of useful for this sort of thing. Um, I did find one thing uh, in terms of code size optimization, which is the way that we do translations is we have um, a function called translate that gets generated where it takes in the regular English string and then it has this big long if statement, if statement chain that does string comparisons between that and the other copy and then it returns the compressed data. Um, that works pretty well on LTO builds where uh, LTO is link time optimization. So basically that whole function disappears and all you're left with is the, the compressed data at the end. Um, However, that's not the way that was working on non-LTO builds, such as all of the ESP stuff. Um, and so I figured out, or I, I thought of a way to, to be able to do that kind of optimization pass at compile time. And basically, we generate that translate function for every uh, C file that we're compiling, and each one of them independently can optimize it away to what it needs, <laughs> um, which should give us some space back on ESP, which is nice. Um, and so I, there's still some CI failures. It's draft PR. I'll have to follow that up uh, later today. Um, but that should be good, and that should get us some, some space wins on everything that's not LTO'd. So the things that are LTO'd are like NRF, some of NRF, and all of SAMD, I think, are all LTO'd. But on all the other builds, this should, this should uh, get us some wins. Um, uh, I also... I, I had like a few hours on Friday, so I was like, let me just see, Dan and I had talked about this a little bit. Um, there's, we use GCC to do the compilation, but there's also another compiler called Clang um, that is very, uh, doing a lot of development and, and iterating a lot. Um, it's used by big companies like Apple and Google and stuff like that. But the problem is, is that not a lot of embedded stuff is done. Um, so uh, it has really good warnings and I got circuit and compiling with it. Uh, but the reality is that GCC still does better in terms of code size, which is kind of critical for us. Uh, specifically, uh, the LTO versions of Clang can't do dash OS or dash OZ, which are the size optimized versions. So um, I tried that. There's a there's a, a branch there just to see what uh, you need to do for it. But I that's all I'm going to do on that. Um, I did also start prototyping the new serial output, so I figured out like the magic VT100 commands to like put a status bar at the top, um, and so that's something I'll probably work on along with. Uh, that's I think that's kind of the next step to go along with the Wi-Fi work workflow work, um, but we'll see. It might be a bit slow going. Um, that's it for me. Okay, <coughs> thank you, Scott. Uh, next up, I'll read uh, Tech Tricks contributions after a timestamp. Uh, last week, developing more tools to check the libraries for build issues and patch library bundle problems. A very accidental yet timely happenstance. Writing documentation for said tools so others can eventually use them. Helped get the majority of libraries fixed for the new Sphinx version 5.0.0 for, via uh, Adabot, that is using Adabot to automate the changes needed in a lot of libraries. Started playing bug whack-a-mole for a few libraries with additional Sphinx issues due to de deprecations and new features in Sphinx 5.0.0. This week, continue developing patch tools, wrap up manual patch fi fixes for Sphinx upgrade, start manual patches for the previous Pilot Adabot patch, and taking time to hang out with my girlfriend's family. All right. And... Um, finally, we have uh, in the weeds, but there are no weeds this week. Uh, the lawn, the garden has been cleaned up, so we have no weeds, and we're pretty much done. Does anybody else have anything they'd like to bring up before we wrap up the meeting? Okay, I guess not. Um, let me take a timestamp for the ramp up. Uh, this has been the CircuitPython Weekly for Tuesday, 
uh, May 31st, 2022. Usually we're on Mondays. Thank you to everyone who participated, even though it was on an off day this time. If you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, and those of us that work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be available on major podcast services. The newsletter will also be in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. You can visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. Next week's meeting will be held on Monday at the regular time, 2 p.m. Eastern U.S. time, 11 a.m. Pacific, and it's 1600 uh, hours UTC this sum in the summer. Um, the meeting is held on Adafruit Discord. You can join by going to adafru.it slash discord. And if you want to find out about this meeting, ask to be added, to be notified, you can uh, uh, be asked to be added to the at sign circuit Pythonistas role on Discord. Thank you, everyone. Uh, short meeting, 30, 30 minutes or so, but we appreciate your contributions. And I will stop recording now. <laughs>